22, August 27th, 1914, Laughing Dawn of Despair by Frederick Coleman, read by Jeffrey Yolis. Mr. Coleman, a pioneer motorist, was one of the members of the RAC who volunteered their services and their cars at the outbreak of war. Constantly on the move in the battle area, Mr. Coleman had a close-up view of much of the fighting. His amusing account of the retreat through San Quentin on the morning of August 27th differs considerably from the unhappy picture that Colonel Osborne draws in the succeeding section of the latter hours of this fatal day. The morning of Thursday, August 27th, found us in the direct path of what in the early hours of the day we believed to be but the remnant of the shattered left of the British Army. Like the dawn of the day before, the morning broke clear and warm, promising a hot summer day. The perfect mornings on the retreat were some compensation for our short hours of rest. San Quentin on Thursday, August 27th, saw rare scenes and strange sights. An orderly, well-disciplined army had been through a great fight. Its infantry, unbeaten by the infantry they opposed it, had been ordered to retire. God knows why, hundreds of Tommies were saying. The vastness of the scale of operations, the uncertainty of the general staff itself, as to just what was happening at some quarters of the field, and the universal ignorance of the rank and file as to what had happened elsewhere than in their own immediate vicinity, all tended to discouragement. After inflicting such terrible losses as the German foot soldiers suffered at Cambrai with Cateau, the British army had taken a hammering which seemed to many of them totally unnecessary. To fight stubbornly and victoriously against an advancing enemy, hurling back his masses as fast as they are poured forward, is soul-inspiring. To leave such occupation for a scamper over a shell-swept field, comrades falling to right and left as they run, is not. Units that had just proven to themselves their invincibility were smashed and disintegrated in the very obeying of an unwelcome order to retire. Jumbled together, inextricably mixed, every group convinced that their little remnant contained the only survivors of their individual command. Confusion worse confounded was only to be expected. The work of sorting out the men from the steady flowing stream of humanity as it moved southward, of reforming an army that had lost most semblance of form, was the task set before the British officers in St. Quentin that morning at sunup. It did not take them long to set about it. Stationed here and there along the main route through the town, each officer of staff became an usher, urbanely advising each little knot of stragglers where to proceed to find the nucleus of their particular unit and obtain food, drink, and news of their comrades. The wounded were in considerable numbers. Ambulances drew up at the railway station and unloaded. A couple of sweet little old French ladies bustled about on one side of the station square, giving out tea as fast as they could make it. Moving about St. Quentin in a motor car that morning was slow work, as the roads were full to overflowing. Not far from the Marais, a wounded officer, his vitality all but spent, was placed in my car. I took him as quickly as possible to the station. Badly wounded in the chest, he said with a pale smile, I've been about a hundred miles, it seems, since I was hit, and in pretty well every sort of conveyance except a motor car. Two miles on a limber nearly finished me. He looked, poor chap, as though he had reached care and attention none too soon. For a time I was to act as usher at a point north of St. Quentin. Placed on the road by a staff officer and told where the men of the various units were be directed, I chose to stand by a French lady who, with her daughters, was supplying coffee steaming hot to the passing Tommies. Never shall I forget that staff officer's party instructions. Cheer them up as you keep them on the move, he said. They are very downhearted. Tell them anything but cheer them up. They've got their tails down a bit, but they are all really all right. No wonder they are tired. 
worn out to begin with, then fighting all day, only to come back all night. No rest, no food, no sleep. Poor devils. Yes, they are very downhearted. Tell them where to go and cheer them up. Cheer them up. Of all the jobs that have ever fallen to my lot, I thought this promises to be one of the most hopeless. Cheer them up indeed. A fine atmosphere this for cheer. Ragged and muddy and footsore they look, straggling along. The first individual who caught my attention particularly was a tall captain, an old acquaintance. He showed me his service cap, through the crown of which two neat bullet holes had been drilled. Both of the vicious little pellets had missed their intended mark. The one had plowed a slight furrow along his scalp, leaving an angry red welt. No one had examined his head to find what damage had been caused, and he asked me to investigate. He bent over, and I poked my finger here and there, saying, Where it hurt, and how much, in short, doing the best I could to accommodate his thirst for information. As I was intent on my amateur probing, a voice from behind commented, A close shave the little devil made that time, sure. Turning at the soft brogue, what was my surprise to see a jock in a kilt that looked as if its wearer had been rolled in the mud. Capless, his shock of red hair stood on end, and a pair of blue Irish eyes twinkled merrily. I was genuinely surprised. It was before I had learned that an Irishman in a Scotch regiment is no rara avis, nor a cockney in a battalion dubbed Irish on the rolls for the matter of that. As if entering himself in a competition of close shaves, the Irishman held his right ear between thumb and finger. And what do you think of that, he queried. Right through the lobe of his ear, close to his cheek, a Mauser bullet had drilled a clean hole. Close that, I'm thinking, said the proud owner of the damaged member, and I never knew how close me ear was to me head till that thing come along. A burst of laughter from the group that had gathered was infectious. The boys trailed off together, chatting over further stories of close shaves, leaving me thankful the Irish lad had come by, cheered that lot up, and so saved me the task. The next group to reach me contained a sergeant and a dozen or so Tommies of most disreputable exterior. To what walk do you belong, sergeant? I asked. We're Riles, sir, said the argent. You're what? Riles, with decided emphasis. With a spasm, I remembered that the Royal Fusiliers were in the 9th Brigade of the 3rd Division and directed the group accordingly. You ought to know who we are, said the sergeant somewhat haughtily. We're in the what was first in Mons and last out we are. That's right, piped up a squeaky voice that came from a diminutive member of the squad. Buck, you beggar, Buck. Tell him the tale. A grin on half a dozen faces told that the small one might be expected to produce some comment when occasion permitted. The sergeant turned. What's that when you, shorty, he demanded. Tell him the tale, croaked the little man. Fussed in mons and last out. And at three miles an hour and at, at eighteen. That's us, you bet. And he snorted as the squad roared in appreciative mirth. So they drifted on anything but downhearted if one could judge from the ruddy fire of banter between Shorty and his sergeant, which kept their comrades in continual chuckles as they toiled on. Truly I thanked Shorty for his assistance in the cheer up department. Detachments went past at times in step, whistling or singing. Some were obviously too footsore to walk normally, but they heroically tried to keep pace with the rest and made a brief show of it. One big lantern-jawed chap, as he caught sight of me, insisted on his score of companions forming single file. They brought rifles to shoulder and stepped out in style with an indescribable swagger. The Sphinx would have broken into a smile at the sight of them. As the leader, much begrinned, came up, I explained that hot coffee was to be had from jugs held by three little pigtailed French school girls under a tree hard by. As the boys drank, the leading spirit chatted. I gathered from casual remarks, if they were to be believed, that talking was a habit with him. In fact, remarks were proffered 
Soto Roche, that he had not ceased talking except to sleep since leaving England. The comments of his soiled band seemed meat and drink to his soul. He fairly reveled in them. Pals, we are all right, he said with a grin, though no one would think it to hear him, would they? Know how to fight they do, but can't talk. That is their drawback. Don't know no words. A hot, strong draft of good black French coffee gave him pause, but a moment later he was at it again. I told him where to go. As he tramped off, he said, Come on, you blighters, don't block the road. You ain't no bloomin' army now. You are a 4-1 oak. That's what you are. Nice-looking lot of beggars. Op it. And they opt it to the music of his cheery abuse. God bless him. Not long after, a very woe-begone procession hove in sight. But few were in that squad, and they seemed very worn and tired. Red-eyed from lack of sleep, barren of equipment, many a cat missing, and not a pair of sound feet in the lot. Every man had his rifle, but they looked very done. Here are the pessimists at last, thought I, and will take something to cheer this bunch. I discovered their regiment and informed them of the whereabouts of their fellows. Yes, said I, three seats on after you get to the fountain, then to the right, and then you'll see a big building on the left. That's the one. We've been rear guard and sent a cadaverous corporal back to the spokesman. We're proper rear guards, we are, been doing nothing else but rear guarding. Right, said I, don't forget. Third turn in after the fountain. Plenty of food there. Rear guards we are, from the lugubrious one. Proper rear guards, ain't done nothing else for three days. Cheerio, I insisted. Three streets on after the fountain, and then... Proper rear guards, he started again, but I interrupted in turn. I'm telling you where there's food, my boy. And I'm telling you, sir, if you'll not mind, he continued gravely, that we're proper rear guards we are. We have learned one thing that brought proper rear guards in this ear war right off, and that is that rear guards ain't expected to eat. So we have given up, we have. It's a bad habit anyhow, ain't it, boys? Off they trudge, grinning. The funereal visage of the spokesman turned and indulged in a somber wink, whereat they laughed to a man and I with them. Proper rear guards don't eat. He had had his joke and played it out to his heart's content. Ah, well, it was an experience. I had not been long in that roadside when I realized that many of us had been laboring under a great delusion. It was not that someone was needed to cheer up the Tommy, it was that most of us needed the Tommy to cheer us up. The indomitable pluck of the soldier in the ranks and his effervescent cheeriness was to save the retreating army of Smith Dorians as no staff work could have saved it had the Tommy not possessed those characteristics to such remarkable degree. Many an officer whose hair had grown gray in the service said that day that Tommy was a finer metal than he had ever dreamed it possible of any soldier. The very air was full of unostentatious heroism. One bristled brigadier, seated on his horse, watched that straggling army pass, tears dropping now and then unheeded on his tunic, his lips pressed hard. One of his staff heard the old warrior mutter as one detachment passed, soiled, but with bold eye and shoulders well back, ah, they may be able to kill such men, but they will never be able to beat them. I began to look at the men with new eyes as the morning passed. If the thousands struggling by had continued to come, I thought, many more must have been saved than any of us imagined. Beneath the grime and dirt and weariness, I saw clear eyes and firm jaws, even when men were almost too worn out to walk further. Those who appeared to be positively unable to go on were stopped at the St. Quentin station to be sent south by rail. I realized that in front of me was passing a pageant such as men had rarely seen in the ages. It was a pageant of the indomitable will and unconquerable power of the Anglo-Saxon. Early in the day, I was relieved and sent back to the station. Horse wagons full of wounded jostled the ambulances in the station yard. Even the motor transport lorries, as they rolled past, paused to drop off their quota of maimed and bandaged men in khaki. One young subaltern passed, sound asleep in his saddle and unmindful of all about him, his horse following the human current. 
At times, a pitiable group of refugees went by, though for the most part the refugees who had crowded off the main roads by the retreating army or were diverted to other routes. A sergeant of the East Surrey Regiment of Ferguson's division came up. His face was haggard. He reported that 250 men with five officers were all that was left of that battalion. Standing near the bridge, close by the station, I saw General Smith Dorian a few feet distant. He turned, and I caught his eye. He was speaking to a passing officer. I hardly remember his words. Something about plenty more of the same command being down the road a bit, I think. It was good to see Smith Dorian's face and hear his voice. I had heard much of him during those days, and never was he spoken of save in terms of affection. As he looked my way, he smiled, the sort of smile that everyone within range takes to himself as his own property. It was of inestimable value that morning in St. Quentin, Smith Dorian smiled. It poured hard into many a man. Don't cry.